commitment to the Lord and our commitment to the Lord for your children. Please take your Bible this morning and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 in your Bible for our scripture reading today. We're going to be looking at verse 6 on through the end of the chapter. So if you would like to join me and follow along or just listen carefully as we read God's word today. Beginning in verse 6, 1 Timothy chapter 4. In pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance. For it is for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Thank you, Pastor Steve. Well, we are in 1 Timothy 4 that we just read a few moments ago. So if you are especially new or visiting, we've been making our way through this book, passage by passage, verse by verse. And today we come to chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 16. I encourage you to have an open Bible and follow along uh, as we study together. If you've been with us for the last few months, you know that In 1 Timothy, Paul has been giving instructions to various groups in the church. He has been explaining how each group should behave. If you were here, you know that earlier he said, made it clear that uh, what men should and should not do in the church. And what women should and should not do. What Overseers or elders should and should not do what deacons should and should not do. And then last week, what all the members of God's household should and should not do. Now, you may think, well, sounds like he's talked to everybody. Well, not quite. Paul has one more audience in mind. In our passage today... The Apostle Paul wants to talk to Timothy about Timothy. Now that raises an interesting question. Well, wait wait a minute. What is Timothy in this church? You may think, well, isn't he a man? And isn't he a member? And isn't he an elder? And the answer would be yes. But he's also something more than that. In fact, you've all heard of Disney Plus. Timothy was like an elder plus in this church. He had a unique relationship to Paul and was sent by Paul for a reason, but he also had a unique relationship and a unique job in this congregation. Both he and Titus, we can see. And we see that job in this passage. I I don't know if you noticed earlier, but there are eight different references in this passage to some form of teaching. He keeps stressing 
this idea of teaching. Now, a few weeks ago, we saw that in the qualifications of an elder, every elder is supposed to be able to teach. But Timothy is commanded to teach. It, it appears that he is the main teacher. That he is essentially the teacher of the teachers in this church. And I think that Timothy is what we would then sort of today call the preacher of this congregation. Now, different churches use different titles for this role. You've heard of titles like senior pastor or lead pastor. Here at Forest, we use a phrase from Ephesians 4 where he speaks of pastor hyphen teacher. That's the title that I have. You, you may wonder, well, wait a minute, what's your relationship to the elders? This, this may help. I, I'm one of seven elders, and I have, I have one vote like they do. So I, I do not have more authority in this church. But I do have more influence. That, that's the nature of what I do. You know, f funny thing, it turns out people listen to the guy with the microphone when he talks. <laughs> and Timothy was the guy with the microphone. And Paul's point is, the guy with the microphone has the most influence and therefore has the most responsibility. And he says, you need to make sure, Timothy, that you are doing the job and the task that the congregation needs. So, so you can think of whatever role you want as we look at this, whatever title, senior pastor, teaching pastor, lead pastor, head honcho, big cheese, benevolent dictator, whatever, whatever term you, you might use. Timothy's role is essentially my role. A, a church needs leaders, but even leaders need a leader. And, and Paul is pressing into Timothy his job as that leader. Now, some of you are putting two and two together now, thinking, oh, wait a minute. So you're about to preach a sermon about you preaching sermons. Sort of. And you're thinking, well, why am I here? Why, why do I need this passage? Why do I need to hear this? I, I give you two quick reasons. Number one, I could die tonight. Now, I don't plan on it. That wasn't a threat. Sorry if it sounded you know, ominous, but I, I might not do this forever. I, I certainly won't do this forever. In, in fact, I, I don't know what the Lord might do in my life. I have no plans of going anywhere else. In fact, my greatest joy would be to bury all of you. That's my, that's my goal. <laughs> I meant that nicely. That wasn't rude, you know. <laughs> but I might not get to do that. And I think it's part of my task is to prepare you for the next guy. Whether that's five months from now or 50 years from now. So you need to know what to look for in a good preacher. But number two, God could not only move me on, but, but maybe more likely, God could move you on. I, I often talk to former church members that sometimes struggle in a new city or in a new place trying to find a new church. And, and I'm very humbled and very grateful that many of them, they'll, they'll say very kind things. and say, you know, we've tried churches, but nobody preaches like you do. And while I appreciate that, please listen to me very, very closely. If God moves you from this place, you should not be looking for me and another preacher. You should be looking for this and another preacher. Let's, let's not become a cult of personality. The word is what people need. The word is what the preacher should preach. And the word is what we should give our attention to. Good preachers can have different styles, different giftings, different abilities. The question is, do they have the same biblical priorities? That's the key. So what are those priorities of a good preacher? Well, we'll see two in the text before us. In fact, if you want to kind of look ahead, a little, little hint here, 
Verse 16, I think, gives us our outline. Paul says, pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. That's the two responsibilities. Pay attention to yourself and to your teaching. So let's deep dive deep into both of those. The first one we see in verses 6 through 10, first priority is this. Number one, a good preacher prioritizes personal discipline. A good preacher prioritizes personal discipline. Notice verse 6. He says, in pointing, these, excuse me, in pointing out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrine which you have been following. So notice Paul begins with the first reference to Timothy's teaching. And I like how he says it. Some of your Bibles say instructing, but I, my translation says, in pointing out these things to the brethren. I like that phrase. I imagine Timothy doing what I try to do many times is pointing out things to you. And I say, well, look at, look at that verse. Look at that, look at that phrase. Notice how that got repeated all the way through here. It doesn't say cram it down their throats. It says to point it out to them and help them to see in God's word what is clearly and plainly there. And, and the job of a good preacher is to to, to, to put the word of God out so that all the brothers and sisters can, can see it and understand it for themselves. And he says, if you do this, verse 6, then you will be a good servant. Now that's important. A preacher must first see himself as a servant. It's true for all pastors. They, they must see themselves as a servant to God's word a servant to God's son, and a servant to God's people. My, my friends, you are not here for me. I am here for you. That is why Christ has me here, to, to minister the word to you, to serve you like a, like a good waiter brings the food to you. You, you know, the, you know the, those guys at the Mexican restaurant when they come out of the back with the sizzling plate of fajitas? And it, it makes you question all of your choices, right? Because it all it smells so good and looks so good. Okay, I want to be that guy. I want the sizzling fajitas of Scripture, all right? I want to bring those to you so you're not looking at me, but you're, you're looking at the fajitas. You're smelling the fajitas. That's a good servant of the Word. He says here, you're not here for yourself. You're here to feed the people. And how do you do that? Because notice what he says in verse 6. Because you yourself are nourished on the words of the faith and the sound doctrine. He says here, you need to be nourished, to be fed on the things of God. In fact, this is a great phrase in light of last week where, remember they were saying, you know, don't eat this and don't eat this and don't eat this. And Paul says, no, no, you can eat whatever, but... He uses this little metaphor and says, but if, if you're the one who's doing the teaching and the preaching, the one thing you've got to make sure you do, the one thing you make sure you eat is what Ezekiel was told, eat this book. Eat the book. He was told to what? To be nourished on the words of God. To, to know the sound doctrine, to be built up in it. Why? So that he could then instruct and help others do the same. He who does not feed himself will be unable to feed others. And so he says here, make sure that you are being nourished on the words of the faith and the sound doctrine. It's where we get our, 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 our doctrinal uh, uh, iron in our bloodstream. It's what gives us the strength. We get protein from the promises of God. We feed on it, we are nourished on it so that we can have the energy and life that we need to live this Christian life. Now normally this is where I would probably turn and look to you and say, okay, we're supposed to be nourished on the word. And I would ask you, so how's your quiet time been? Are you being nourished in the word? But to really be true to the text here, the question is not me asking you. The question is the opposite. You're the one that should be asking me. Pastor, how's your time in the Word? Don't, don't shy away from asking that of our elders. I give you the green light. Ask them, are you being nourished in the Word? Hold us accountable to this. 
Because if we are not being fed in the truth of God, then we cannot feed you the truth of God. And Paul says you've you got to have the discipline to be nourished in the word. So how does he do this? Well, it takes discipline. Notice verse 7. Have nothing to do with worldly fables fit only for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Now, Paul is not insulting senior adult women with that phrase. It's a common expression then. Uh, many older women in that day were not educated and therefore were considered to be gullible. And it was just sort of a, a, a common phrase. But there were these pseudo-spiritual ideas floating around that like, you know, sort of leeches would attach themselves to Christianity. And we, we see this, they just sort of get connected to things that they're not really biblical, but they sound kind of spiritual. And some pastors even, they'll get, they'll get totally distracted by this and get caught up into these things. As a congregation, I want you to be on the lookout for false teaching, but just as much, I want you to be on the lookout for trivial teaching. There's a good deal of trivial teaching where it's, it sounds spiritual, it's kind of got this thing, but it, it's not actually the meat of the word. If, if the preacher spends more time talking about the newspaper than the Bible, there's a problem. People need the word. And so he says, have nothing to do with worldly fables, but instead discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Paul switches metaphors here from, from eating to exercising. By the way, I think it's good because those two often go together, do they not? I mean, just imagine, you, you go to the gym, right? You can, you know, do push-ups and pull-ups and that rope thing and ride a bike and, you know, do all the stuff but then if you go home and eat ding-dongs and ho-hos and yoo-hoo, right? It's not going to do you any good. You, you can't have a bad diet and, and good exercise, right? It's, it doesn't work. So Paul tells Timothy, you, you got to have both. Discipline requires the good eating and the good exercising. So what's the exercising? He says to discipline yourself. This Greek word is actually where we get our word gymnasium from. It's sort of like gymnasticize yourself. It means to exercise. It means to train. It means to, 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 to go to the, the spiritual gym. Make it your habit. Be consistent, he says, to be disciplined in these things. Ask anyone who's tried, whether it's you know, dieting or learning a new skill or, uh, or, again, exercise. Discipline takes time. We, we live in a world that, that presses us for what's right now and what's immediate. And I know we have, you know, instant noodles and instant replay, but there is no such thing as instant godliness. You won't just want, wake up one day and be godly. It comes through discipline. It, it, it comes through putting yourself under the word. You, you won't become muscular by going to the gym once a week, and you won't become godly by just praying once a week. You must consistently put yourself in discipline under the things of God. And what's the goal of this? He says the goal is godliness, for the purpose of godliness. Think about that idea. What is it that people look for in those that will be pastors or that will lead churches? So often our list sometimes it includes you know, abilities and giftings. And while those things are important and helpful, the Apostle Paul says the number one thing you should look for is not giftedness, but godliness. Is this someone who's pressing deeper into a God-centered life, a God-focused life? They're leaning on the promises of God and they're clinging to God and they, they, they follow in obedience. They're reflecting his character in the way in which they live. If you spend time with one of our elders, I would hope you would walk away encouraged and challenged and loved and so many things. But I hope somewhere in the back of your head you walk away thinking, that man knows God. That's what we need. Those that shepherd the church are growing in godliness. Why? So that we will all grow in that godliness. By the way, notice in verse 7, that next word there, he says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. Paul can't do this for Timothy. 
Your wife can't do this for you. Your husband can't do this for you. Your, your parents can't do this for you. Nobody else can do this for you. Philippians says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Sanctification is, a, is an individual project that we ourselves must give ourselves to. And I think it's a good reminder that godliness is not transferable. I think some people, they take a false assurance in things kind of nostalgic going, well, you know, my grandmother was such a godly woman. Well, good for her. Right, that's good. That's a legacy. But that doesn't come through your genes. You must be disciplined. You must be a person of prayer. You must be in the word. You must give yourself to take up the mantle and live out that legacy. And the Apostle Paul says, you, you know, discipline yourself towards godliness. Why should we do this? Well, he says in verse 8, because bodily discipline is only of little profit, but godliness is profitable for all things. Now, I like how he starts verse 8. Bodily discipline is of little or of some profit. I think this is actually a helpful counterbalance to last week's text. Remember last week where the Apostle Paul, he spoke positively of the body? He encouraged us in marriage and sex. He encouraged us in eating and drinking. These were made by God. We should receive them from God. Therefore, we should do that. He also drew our attention to the incarnation. The body can't be bad if God took on a body, right? Christ came into the world. And so he spent all this time to say, now, no, don't, don't misunderstand. The body is good. But now it's as if he says, but don't get carried away. The body is something, but the body's not everything. You need to keep it in balance. We live in a world today that sometimes is very, very body conscious, very obsessed with you know, chiseled, chiseled abs and giant pecs and whatever else. The Apostle Paul would say, well, that stuff is good. Don't, don't focus on the outer man and neglect your inner man. Your outer man will only take you so far, and that is to the grave. Your inner man, that, that's beneficial long beyond. What, what, what good is it to run a marathon if you don't know how to run from temptation? What, what good is it to have big muscles but a tiny heart? It's great to have a gym partner. It is better to have an accountability partner. Paul says this is vital wine because it holds, verse 8, promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Don't focus on your body at the neglect of your soul because your body will go into the grave. But the question is, what about the inner man? He says it's preparing you for eternity. Exercise has benefits, limited benefits, but godliness has unlimited benefits. Godliness will help you at the gym. It will also help you in traffic going to the gym. And it will help you at work and help you at home and help you at church, help you with your neighbor. It will help you in every situation when times are good and times are bad. Godliness, it is producing in you something that will be beneficial in every circumstance. In fact, this is so important. Notice in verse 9, he says, it's a trustworthy statement deserving of full acceptance. I think that refers to verse 8, that this idea of discipline and its benefit, discipline of the soul, discipline of the body in service to God, he says this deserves what? Full acceptance. And in other words, it's not just that the preacher should accept this. He's pressing that point in to Timothy but he says this statement is not just for the preachers among us. This statement is for all Christians. It is deserving full acceptance. If you call yourself a Christian, then understand, he says, it is trustworthy, it is worthwhile to make sure that godliness is something you're pursuing. Especially not at the neglect of pursuing your own body. So, so let me ask that question then. If we're all supposed to be pursuing godliness and it's a trustworthy thing, how, how are you doing that? I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm trying, you know, uh, whether it's exercise or, you know, new diet or some skill or something, right? What's the tendency? The tendency is to kind of be sporadic. 
right? You might do it for a while, then you kind of back off and fall away and do it. So, on. so, so let me ask that question. Is that true in your spiritual life? Do you just sort of pray sporadically, man, when times are hard? Or do you pray with discipline? Do, do, you, do you give your money to God in the offering box sporadically? Yeah, I got a few bucks. Or do you do so regularly and sacrificially? Do, do you serve other people when, well, I got a little extra time kind of sporadically? Or are you committed to using your gifts in service to others? Paul says, discipline yourself. This is worthy of everybody's acceptance. Everyone should embrace this priority in your life. So where do you need more discipline? Where where, where do you need to be pursuing godliness? By the way, if you want more on this, I highly recommend a book entitled Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life by Donald Whitney. Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life life why do we do all this verse 10 for it's for this reason we labor and strive again back to paul's point to timothy as a pastor as a preacher as a teacher he says this work is laboring and striving it's hard work we keep doing it why because we fixed our hope on the living god the the reason that i i try to put time and effort to preach and teach Every Sunday like this is not because I have hope in my sermon. It's because I have hope in God for him to take his word and as the seed is sown for it to bear fruit in your life. And I pray every week for for faith and obedience as you leave this place that the living God will do a living work in your life. And it would not just be something we check off and walk away from, but to labor and strive. In hope. And who is this God? He says in verse 10, He is the Savior of all men, especially of believers. I know the phrasing there throws some people off, but I don't think this is any different than what Paul said earlier back in chapter 2. He's not teaching universalism here. He's simply stating that God's the one who provides salvation for all people. Back in chapter 2, he said God desires all men to be saved. And that Christ died a ransom for all. And so he's stating very clearly that that, that redemption was his idea and his work, not ours. The cross was his idea and his work, not ours. And the death and resurrection of Christ was his work, not ours. And so we simply receive this gift. We receive this salvation from God. And my friend... If you don't know God as your Savior, you can know Him today. Today you can trust Him. Today you can receive Him. See, the Bible says all of us have sinned against God. All of us, guess what? We've not been disciplined in our godliness. Oh, maybe we try. Oh, this year I'm going to go to church. This year I'm going to read my Bible. And we find ourselves coming up short, kind of doing it in our own strength. And sometimes we're trying to, I'm just going to be a good person. But being ignorant of God's righteousness, we seek to establish our own, but we know deep down it's never good enough. My friends, that is the good news of the gospel, that Jesus came to die for our shortcomings, for our sins, for our failures, and to grant forgiveness, and not only that, but to now give us his righteousness. And we receive that by faith, not of works, not by money, but by faith, and turning to him and believing on him. My friends, don't walk away from Jesus. Don't don't put him on the shelf with other teachers. He died and rose again to bring you salvation. Trust him. Believe on him. And he will save you. And Paul says those of us who have been saved, those of us who believe, we press on in knowing him. We press on in godliness. We press on in growing in the image of Christ. So back to Paul's main message here to Timothy. He said, if you want to be a good preacher, then you must have personal discipline. J.C. Rowell famously said, there are no spiritual gains without spiritual pains. We should all embrace that idea. To the young men in our church, and I know we have several who are aspiring to be pastors, who are maybe students studying religion or pursuing ministry, 
Are you aware of what you're signing up for? Have you identified those, those besetting sins? Have, have you, are you developing the habits, the priorities that will help you to grow deeper in the things of Christ? Or do you think, yeah, I'll, I'll get to that one day. When I finally become a pastor, then I'll take it seriously. No, no, Paul is saying you do it now. Grow in the things of Christ now. Be a faithful person, and then you will be entrusted to be faithful over many things. And I would honestly ask you to pray for me. Pray that I'll continue in these things. Pray that I will be a good servant of Christ. That I will be nourished on the word. Pray that I wouldn't have anything to do with worldly fables and spiritual junk food in this world. Pray that I'll be disciplined. Pray that I will have hope in the living God and labor and strive as he's called me to do. For all those that seek to preach the word, they should not disqualify themselves by their own lives but should prioritize personal discipline. Number two, we see in verse 11 to 16, the second responsibility, a good preacher prioritizes pastoral duties. So personal discipline, and then verses 11 through 16, pastoral duties. Now, if you just look in your Bible real quick, notice verses 11 through 16 is a separate paragraph. Paul is shifting gears here. He's, he's still talking to Timothy, but he moves from sort of the private personal sphere now to the public sphere he's moving from the discipline to the duties in other words you're going to be a good servant you got to do some things when nobody's looking and then you got to do some things when everybody's looking so he sets before him these responsibilities now there's actually 12 commands crammed in these few verses but they really come in pairs so there's six pastoral duties that we see one in each verse, and I want to show each of them to you. Duty number one, verse 11, is to teach. To teach. All right, what, what should you expect a preacher, a pastor, a senior pastor to do? Verse 11, prescribe and teach these things. To command and to instruct the people of God in the word of God. The, the call is not to entertain the call is not to amuse. The, the call is not simply to, to gain a crowd. The call is to teach and to preach and to instruct. I actually like the word in the, in the NASB here, prescribe. A, a good preacher is like a good doctor. He has his finger on the pulse, right? Can, can see where there's sickness that maybe you can't see and knows exactly what prescription to write, right, to give to you. He says, make it your habit to prescribe and teach these things as they need it. Faithful, careful teaching of God's word. He says, that's what you should expect. I think it's sad that I think many Christians have adopted a more business mindset about what pastors do. And maybe you have and don't even realize it. I'll give you, let's, I'll give you one little example. Down the hall here, there's a room where I have my books and commentaries and desk. And, you know, if you ever see me around during the week, that's usually where I am. If I was to ask you, what is that space there? Many people would call it, oh, that's the pastor's office, right? A hundred years ago, we called it the pastor's study. You see the difference? Oh, there's administration, there's business that has to happen, there's overseeing. But this is the thing. Prescribe and teach. To give yourself to be a student of the word, to then properly and rightly divide the word, to teach the word, to feed the people with the word of God. So if my duty in verse 11 is to teach God's word, that means you have a duty, which is what? It's to learn God's word. It's, it's to listen attentively to the word. And by the way, for what it's worth, you are a very easy church to preach to. You are hungry 
for the word. But can I just ask as an individual, do you, do you, do you have a teachable spirit? Or do you sometimes approach sermons going, oh, yeah, I've heard that before. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've learned this 30 years ago. We should all come with an eager heart, fresh, ready. Lord, what would you teach me today through your word? Prescribe and teach. Number two, second duty is to model. That's verse 12. Model. He says in verse 12, let no one look down on your youthfulness but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. Timothy was young. We don't know exactly how young, but um, probably 30s, maybe even beneath that age. He was young enough for, for Paul to call him youthful in verse 12. Now, while age does not disqualify a man from ministry, immaturity does. And so Paul says, listen, you you need to understand that even though you might be young and culturally in that day, they might have looked down, you're you're not old enough to truly be an elder in the church. Paul says, whoa, 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 time out. He says, Timothy, here's your job. You should live in such a way that people will not look down on you, but they will look up to you. They will hear your words as as being God's words. That they will understand and see your conduct as being Christ-like. They will see your faith and, and hope and trusting in the Lord. And they should see a pattern in you that they themselves could follow. So if it's my duty to, to model Christian virtue, then what's your duty? It's to copy Christian virtue. And, and to be clear, this is not just follow me. It's what Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. If I stop following Christ, then you better stop following me. He says, but, but, but as long as the example that's being set is the good example that sums up the very virtues and life of Christ, then you should follow. And, and for what it's worth, can I just say this? It burdens me so much when Christian people look to their favorite politician before looking to their pastor for how to live. As if that's the example. Brothers and sisters, this is where we should find our examples. In the godly shepherds and leaders that he has put in the life of the church. Teach, model, number three, read. Verse 13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Notice again, He keeps coming back to this idea, teaching, exhorting, prescribing, instructing, commanding. But what is Timothy supposed to be teaching and instructing? He makes it very clear in verse 13. He says, give attention to the reading. Some Bibles add public and scripture, which it certainly was, but it's literally just the reading. The local church, uh, the early church, adopted the synagogue practice of reading the scriptures from either the prophets or from the apostles. We see that in the New Testament. In other words, there was actual scripture reading that happened when everybody gathered together to hear God's word. And Paul says, make sure that you read the scriptures. And in a day, by the way, prior to you know, the printing press, it was the only time people actually got to hear the Bible. So they would listen with attention because they knew God was speaking in that moment. So, so if my duty is to read scripture, then what is your duty? Your duty, of course, is to listen to Scripture. Have an open Bible on your lap. Help your children know where the passage is and follow along. And in particular, when the Scriptures are read, as we do earlier in the service or anytime it's read, I hope you will listen with attention. Because, brothers and sisters, when the Bible is read, God is speaking. In fact, it is the only inerrant part of the service when we read the Bible. It's the only part that is fully trustworthy in every possible way. And so he says here, give attention to the reading of Scripture. And those that would seek to teach the Word must read it. My own personal hot take on this for what it's worth, if a man does not like to read, I question his call to ministry. I really do. You say, why? Why? Because God gave us a book. 
And the book needs to be read and studied and understood so that it can then be taught to God's people. Next, we see in verse 14, to serve. To teach, to model, to read, verse 14, to serve. He says, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Now, there's a lot going on in verse 14, and I don't have answers to all of your questions. But when he says there, the, the laying on of hands, this was, we see this in the book of Acts, especially when church leaders were set apart, when Acts 6, what are likely deacons, Acts 13, missionaries were sent out here, when a pastor is being recognized, that, that what we sometimes call ordination, there's a laying on of hands. And it's done by, again, the NASB says the presbytery, or it means the council of elders. The, the, those that are, that are set apart to serve the church in that way. And typically, or, or in this case, it says that apparently Timothy received a spiritual gift when that happened through a prophetic utterance. You say, what does that mean? I don't know. You say, how did that happen? I don't know. You say, what do you know? I know that Timothy was not supposed to neglect it. That's what he says. Do not neglect the spiritual gift. The, the picture is like letting a fire die out. What, what do you do to keep a fire going? You've got to stoke it. You poke it. You, you add some wood to it. You, you inflame it. You help it continue to grow and burn. If you leave it alone, what happens? It, it'll die out. He says you, you need to use your gift in this way. Do the thing that God has gifted you to do, and you do it in service to others. So if my duty is to use my spiritual gift in teaching and preaching, then what is your duty? Your duty is to use your spiritual gift. Now think about this. If all you do on Sunday morning is show up at, in this case, 11 o'clock, and all you do is show up to hear me use my spiritual gift, you're neglecting your spiritual gift. I use my gift to teach, to inflame you, to use your gift. 1 Corinthians 12 says, Each one has received a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So I teach and encourage, why? So that you can serve and that you can, can give, so that you can show mercy, so that you can be hospitable, so that as a body, everyone uses their gifts to build up one another. In fact, I think I can argue my gift is not more important than yours. It's just louder. <laughs> we all must use our gifts. It says, Timothy, use your gifts so that everyone else can, can use their gifts. Verse 15, to grow. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. He says, be diligent, concentrate, bury yourself up to your neck in this work, he says. And notice he says there, take pains with it so that your progress will be evident to all. I think there's a great reminder in that little phrase there that even when it comes to the preacher, the congregation should not expect perfection, but they should expect progression. If I haven't already, I will disappoint you. I, I will mess up. If you don't believe me, just ask my wife. She knows me better than anybody. It is a daunting thing to be a fallible man and preach the infallible word. I never feel like I live up to the things that I say. But Paul says, but there should be a visible growth that comes through the invisible discipline. Others should be able to see a difference as time goes by so that your progress is evident. So if my duty is to grow, then what is your duty? Your duty as a church is to be patient. Your duty as a church is to encourage. Your duty is a growth to ensure that that, that, that can be done. By the way, the same is true, I think, across our church. We, we have young staff members. We, we have even now young elders. We should look to them and encourage them with patience to watch them grow as they seek to serve our church. Final duty, verse 16, is to endure. 
endure. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. Paul says you, you want to be a good servant of Christ Jesus? You want to be a good preacher and teacher? You, you, you want to be what, what I'm telling you to do? He says that the formula is pretty simple. He says read the scriptures, teach the scriptures, and do it Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Keep doing it. Persevere. Endure week after week. And the compounding effect of God's word and the life of those who seek to live out God's word will be a powerful magnet that draws all of God's people towards godliness and unites us together around the gospel. You say, why, why do you need to know my to-do list as a, as a pastor? Look what he says at the end of verse 16. As you do these things, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Do you see what's at stake? He says, if you don't do your job, they're not going to be able to do their job. There's something here that's beneficial in both regards. Your task is to see to it. They don't veer off the path into false teaching, but no, by being faithful and to the word, you will ensure salvation for them, but also in doing this, you will ensure salvation for yourself. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a famous Welsh preacher from a generation ago, I don't know if you'll get this or not, but he used to have this, this phrase that I think really touches on why this matters here. Lloyd-Jones used to say that sermonettes produce Christianettes. A shallow pulpit will lead to a shallow church. If the preacher isn't pursuing God, then the people will not know how to pursue God. If, if the pastor is not praying, why would the people be expected to pray? If the pastor is not faithful, why would the people be expected to be faithful? He says, you need to set a good example and you need to continue in these things so that all of us will press on in salvation to know Jesus Christ better. Charles Spurgeon, in one of his works, it's entitled Lectures to My Students when he taught and trained pastors. Spurgeon, in his work, he spoke of a man who, quote, preached so well and lived so bad that when he was in the pulpit, everybody said he should never leave. And when he was out of the pulpit, everybody said he should never return. What, what a sobering thought. No, no. The, 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 the life in and the life out should match. The disciplines and the duties should be pressed on in the things of Christ. And so I covet your prayers. I appreciate your encouragement, the resources and times and freedom you give for me to do my job, but I ask of you that you would continue to hold me to it. I need that accountability. I need that encouragement. I need that challenge to ensure my own salvation and yours as we press on in faith to the Lord Jesus. Let's pray.